Uh, my my next twenty minutes will be NGS in hematopathology, and I will be trying to show you two aspects that uh, that we do in the lab. One is the use of Genexus because it is the latest equipment available, and just trying to show some of the uh, uh, things that we have done. And second is the kinase domain mutation analysis that we have tried to develop it in house and and essay for mutation analysis. For MPNs, as we know, it is a broad a broad uh, disease, and we have myeloproliferative neoplasms, AML, MDS, MPN, eosinophilia, and a lot of mutations like CK, uh, PDGFR alpha, PDGFR beta, ASLX, and PM3. So many mutations have now been defined, defined in many of the diseases uh, that, that, uh, we, uh, that we now consider in myeloid neoplasms, and it is still evolving and now we're moving more, more and more genetics in this area. It is moving entirely to the gen genomics. Of course, it starts with morphology. Cannot escape that. You have to have morphology, you have to have flow before you do in for any kind of molecular. You cannot uh, have a mutation analysis and try to sub subcategorize in any of these areas. Always morphology and flow to get that information. And subsequently, this molecular information, like uh, you now we realize FLIC3 and PMC, BPA kit, and uh, uh, MDS MPNs. I think this is one area of, uh, I'm, I'm again re emphasizing, I have discussed it and previously as well. Is, is to, this molecular information is helping categorize these diseases into the exact categories. A case of uncategorized monocytosis, and you are getting mutations in SRFS2, TET2, uh, SETBP1, or JAK1 can help you categorize into a category of uh, CMML with proper morphological monocytosis, some dysplasia, some eosinophilia. This is helping. And in uncategorized uh, uh, MDS MPNs, uh, 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 the atypical CMLs, we recently got two atypical CMLs negative one fish, negative one paratype. And CML, morphology links like CML, 40% immature myelides, and you have mutations in set BP1 and SLX. So that way, linking out to that, this is a case of AML. So this mutation profiling is helping in, that, uh, in this category, I feel very, very, very much. And um, MPLs will already, and even in MDS, I'll show some cases where mutation profiling is in MDS is helping us categorize or pushing them into some some of the areas where uh, we can classify in a better way. And uh, in uh, uh, the, as we know that uh, the mutation profiling covers demethylation, splice factors, signal transductions, chromatin modifications, transcription factors, and 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 DNA repair mechanisms. So I'll just. Uh, take you through the Genexus platform. So, so as you have been, you know, from morning we have been discussing that you need to prepare library. You have to extract DNA, prepare library, uh, load it to the sequencer, get the results, and then uh, get your data analysis going. But here we have a system where everything is combined, and uh, uh, what we are realizing is extracting the sample and loading it into the sequencer. Of course, whatever sample goes in has to be of very high quality. Because there is no other QC step involved, as Dr. Somer was mentioning, how do you QC your uh, the, the library that is going in? How do you know that it is? We cannot do that. So the only QC step engaged here is the extraction. If your extraction, as Dr. Spandan mentioned, there are so many QC steps, DNA, RNA, good quality, nanograph station, working well in a particular concentration, you are loading, loading into the sequencer, this gives you good results. Of course, there are challenges. It is not that nothing is comes without challenges. There are some limitations and challenges, but this is the area where this field is moving. Fully automation uh, is being uh, is being considered in these areas and successfully so. So, uh, and when, when I was talking just about the sequencer, even the extraction part, I'm told that there is a system available where it can be fully automated. Even extraction is automated and then it is linked to the system. We have not tried that. I think only one system is available in the country. Um, I'm not sure the thermo team is there, but that is also being done. So fully integrated systems are being considered in this area. With this Genexus one, single chip is available at the moment. Uh, this is the chip that is available, GX5. It has four lanes. You can run each lane at a time. A particular assay, for a particular assay, particular number of samples can be done. For myeloid, it is eight DNA and RNA combined. For OP, it is four DNA and RNA combined. For only DNA, you can run 16 samples in two lines. Uh, so that will be kind of you know, optimization which is available. Only drawback being 
that if you have to run this system, it is on. Uh, this chip has to be used within 15 days. If, if it is not used single lanes, then uh, the, this thing goes waste. So if you are not able to utilize one lane in different ways, then uh, this is a big drawback in uh, so using uh, of some of the equipments in, the, in, in this, but we are able to use it. And it gives the results in 24 hours, depending upon the essay, uh, between 18 to 24 hours from loading a sample to the results can be interpreted. Of course, you need to have that many samples to be able to load, uh, like I mentioned, eight samples to be able to use that. And uh, the panel on this, so uh, uh, we are discussing myelin panels. There are different panels available. It is TrueSeq, it is Kyogen, uh, uh, there are a panel available from Thermo Fisher earlier panel. So this is the GX panel available on the GenXS platform. So it is a newer panel, okay? Just to highlight because there are different panels available from different companies. It is a closed system. Only this panel works in this system. Uh, no other panel would work. But this is an upgraded panel of their Hong Kong research essay uh, where the, you have the, the genes and fusions mentioned in red, green, the new ones, and these are mainly implicated in uh, germline implications, uh, uh, neoplasms with germline, there are five or six genes, and there are two fusions, uh, NUP98, as you would know, it is a new gene, which is uh, a new classification, AML with NUP98 fusion has been added. So this does add on, on, on those areas. So this is the panel that is being that we were utilizing, and it tends to come on the many of the MDS, MPN, and uh, MDS-driven changes. So using this panel, we tried to validate, and we ran around 52 samples with 54 mutations, and these were the, uh, the different types of samples were there. This is DNA mutations, then RNA fusions, again Sanger and Fish verified samples we used along with the, uh, the Malloyd reference standard horizon, that is HD829, we use this, and look at the sensitivity, specificity, reproducibility, accuracy, precision, and limit of detection. So this is what we tried out since this was a new assay, and uh, these are the uh, the various types of mutations. Uh, you can see flit 3 ITD uh, insertion, uh, NPM, CVP, uh, DNMT, uh, the duplications in flit 3 uh, ETV6, ASLX, JAK2, 52 base pair. So when you're evaluating, I think it is important to list out different variations, you know, 52 base pairs, 5 base pair, indels, deletions, different subsets of mutations you should try to include at variant allele fractions so that you, are, you know that whether your assay is working right or wrong. I mentioned regarding fleet 3 ITD, most of the published literature, in, in all, all the published literature, I think you would say uh, Fleet 3 is working very nicely. They would cover 100% on the on the all the assays that they would mention. And you would note that in that the Fleet 3 ITD traditionally is less than 100 base pairs. So they would select samples where the Fleet 3 ITD is less than 100 base pairs and run it on the sequencers, which tends to work very well. When, comes, when the Fleet 3 ITD is more than 150 base pairs or 250 base pairs, that is a problematic area for all short read sequencers. Traditionally, with thermo, more than 160 or 170 base pairs is very difficult to pick it up. You know, that is that is a known issue with all the short read sequences. And you should always take your AML or click uh, three results with a pinch of salt if you're not using gene scan assay along with it. Because 5 to 10% of your cases can be false negative. This is rare, but it can happen. So uh, we used this uh, flit three ITDs along with control. Uh, various fusion is a DCR and uh, and the P A twenty one fifteen seventeen different uh, and then MLL and uh, the data looks like as Toro was mentioning you know after the uh, after all the QC steps the uh, this is how it looks like it, the loading and the final reads and uh, and the chip uh, while looking at the chip uh, also you were able to tell that whether this chip is working or not it is a blue chip or a red chip or a bubble is there. Or reads are less, so you come to know the problems when you're looking at this basic QC, uh, just for, for, for QC. And uh, subsequently, when you run your, uh, look at your deep down your data, uh, you can see th this is one sample. How the you know, the how the uh, the graph is. Uh, it is a uh, at what size standard, at what size is the graph is, 
this is for the DNA and subsequently this is for the RNA. So this giving tells me that okay, this is pretty uniform, very good. The, the total reads are good. The coverage is very nice, 300, 3000x. So 3000x is a very, very good coverage when you're looking at and it, this is pretty uniform. So 3000, 3500, 3000, 2000. So it means this is a very good coverage for the sample that we have done. The more the polling that you do, less the coverage will come for all the samples that you use. So if your coverage is done, if I'm using more than eight samples, not possible in this, but in other sequences, if it is eight, if I use 16, my coverage will go down to 500x. Okay, that causes problems. If your run is not right, my particular variant is not right. And there the challenge is somebody is asking, when to use cyber sequencing for confirmation? So then it will be important to use cyber sequencer for verification of their variants if they're not sure. Or if I in my call is, my recommendation is 1000x, I am doing a 250x, getting an angle, am I confident? Even all the protocols I'm using, you need a sender to confirm maybe. So there will be sometimes you need additional techniques to verify that. This is just a QC coverage, really very nice. Whatever I'm getting is very nice. Subsequently, if we are going to see, or we are going to see the IGV, it, it is a good data for me to analyze. And I can confidently report, okay, my data is good to go. This particular case, this is the HD829 control that we used for our validation. And you can see, uh, like ABL1, expected yield frequency 5%, we were getting 5.4% and 5.7% in two runs. You could see most of the things are being picked up, except ASLX. Uh, now you should know that ASLX in this SA is not properly covered. This duplication, which is seen many a times, is not properly covered in this SA. So with all the panels from Thermo Fisher, ASLX is not covered. Literally, this is 300 base pair insertion. It is, it is uh, not covered here and not covered here. So 300 base pair for sure, not covered in, in this uh, essay. Some of the regions are not covered. So apart from this thing, all the things are as per what is expected uh, frequency. So using a control now tells me that ITD is more than 300 base pair. I cannot pick up. ASLX is not. So that is a drawback I have to mention in our limitations. I have to mention in my report that this is not likely to be picked up. And then uh, just to mention these samples, so this is a control that we tested, but this is the uh, actual samples. And I think I have to all very much concurrent. So 22 sample all limitations, including character. So very much in line, even fleet 3 ITDs as well. So the limitation, laser based for fleet 3 ITD is not covered. So henceforth, there are all FLT3s. We run a parallel gene scan based assay. Till now, we, we would have run 600, 500, 600 samples. No discrepancy is there as yet. Whatever is picked up on the uh, assay is being picked up on the, uh, the NGS as well, but, but we do it because we missed out 300 base pair in the validation run. So subsequently, most of the samples are being run. Fusions, all the fusions were picked up. Our concordant, these were fish verified and even negative samples which are negative. So no false calls in that. In fusion detection, the problem comes, what is the low? We don't want to call it positive. Okay, that is a problem. Whether I want to call 100, 100 reads, 200 reads, 500 reads, 1000 reads, what is the read count below which you will call tend to call it positive? And traditionally, 100, uh, somebody calls 50 to 100 is what, uh, you know, many a times you consider positive in, in your reaction. But always this has to be seen in the context of history. I got a sample, I was getting 50 reads, a 21 positive sample. I reported it as negative. It came back. This is a post treatment sample of 821. Are you getting 821? Now, this, this, this history is not available. I'm not able to figure out correctly, and I'm removing that from my algorithm. It also happens sometimes that uh, there are false positives being created in the run. So, you will have to run, you have to have your uh, essay uh, defined very well. Getting 500, 600 reads of very many fusions in a run is not possible. So you have to see that you know whether that run quality is is uh, good. Retesting it with another protocol and repeating the run is very very helpful. Uh, and and we see that there are mistakes happening in that area. Um, so 
that this is the while we were looking at uh, the coverage of cbpa because cbpa is traditionally very very challenging and and i think after discussion with mishra sir presentation we decided to look at uh, both the company level as well as uh, decided to look at the cbpa and and you see here the coverage of the cbpa uh, these are the six applicants here and you see the coverage is very good and um, so uh, uh, cbpa is very good lt3 was covered very well and uh, even the calculator was being covered very well so this is one sample uh, round the two essays. One is the uh, the earlier model research essay where CVP is a problem. Uh, it has to be run in a particular way. It has to be run with iron chef and the current model V2 GX essay. So you see this the sample count is not current in this essay. So same sample, but this uh, this was not current well, and you see the coverage over here. So again, we are showing that okay, V2 GX essay is being is is being uh, uh, running very well. Again, a confirmation of the CBP mutation. Okay, this was this ran very well. And subsequently, after this optimization, we have more than almost 100 runs on GenXS, more than 100 runs, 600 samples, all sorts of samples. And uh, uh, we are getting the uh, 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 uniformity in the runs. Just to share the data from the 13 runs, uh, the, uh, the about the total basis being run, the reads being generated, the loading, and mind you, this is automated loading. Uh, this, we don't do anything in that. We just load this sample. After that, it is fully automated. We don't prescribe anything. Whatever is prescribed is prescribed. You know, uh, but we do QC at the part of extracted DNA. Subsequently, everything the sequencer does. Uh, there is a failure rate. Of course, uh, there are problems. The sample fails uh, in around ten to fifteen percent of the cases, and uh, this is because of the uh, keeping the, uh, the uh, giving a spin at particular way, uh, keeping your cartridges in particular way, or the reagents being some of the issues are there uh, which, which needs to be sorted. And uh, this is some of the mutations that we got. This is not an exhaustive list, but 100, 160 samples that we analyzed. And you can look at the split three LTDs. It is 100 base pairs is what uh, we, we have got here. Uh, I'll not analyze fully the data as yet, just to show that uh, this hundred experience is, is getting picked up nicely here. Okay, and um, uh, uh, this is CVPA, Calmar, and SLT3 showing the coverage is is good uh, in all the samples. This is all samples, samples with the, uh, for reads from a particular CVPA gene. I think all we are getting more than five thousand or ten thousand text coverage. Calmar is more, CVPA is slightly less. But it is all adequately getting covered. And um, uh, fusions also are getting detected. In around 500 samples, around 50 of the fusions we have got. This is just some of the fusions uh, that uh, uh, I'm just sharing some of the fusions. And very recently, a publication has also come up uh, in this area. You can go through it uh, on this rapid and automated uh, sequencing uh, of somatic myeloid and uh, RNA aberrations in myeloid neoplasms using this GenXS platform. Quickly take a few of the cases that, uh, so this was a 40 year old male, likely AML. There were a, a blast in the peripheral blood, 86% blast, referred for uh, molecular testing by using this panel. And you could see um, uh, two fusions, BCR ABL and uh, uh, the Inversion 16 both in the same patient. And uh, since initially we were a little surprised to see that, but and verified both of the uh, both of the fusions. So this is most likely a case of CML in myeloid blast transformation. Uh, but but using this this, this way, it, it helped you pick up quickly that this is a myeloid transformation. Though this was being called as AML and IGV. Again, you need to look at IGV to confirm your findings as Torel had shown. You know. So. Um, Another area where this panel is being utilized is, is, the, myel, uh, is the MRD. I'm just showing one case. To highlight this panel, you cannot use this panel for MRD. Traditionally, for AML MRD, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, you need to go down to plan to 1% and probably DDPCR is the better way of following up these cases. But uh, till 1%, you can use this panel. And this is one such case you could see. Uh, acute leukemia called as AMML, keratin was normal. At diagnosis, we got uh, three mutations that is IDS2, ASLX1, and IPZF. 
they will present at this variant relief fraction 46, 48, and 49 percent at diagnosis. And uh, subsequently, this uh, patient was post chemo again uh, retested, and we were not aware of that. We were not aware of that. It was a blind sample. It came and it went off. And this was the variant allele fraction that it decreased. The idea was to decrease, the rest two were same. And fine, that is on in the October 2nd, October, uh, this, this was, we were told that, you know, this is, this is a repeat sample being done. We were not having the adequate history at that time point. And the question was, you see, every time you're telling it, you're giving the same value. Okay. So, uh, so you could see that you know uh, this could happen in the final cases because these could be German, you know, these two other regions that that have been, these are German and they won't come down. So the other method is what you would have to follow. But in these type of cases, by getting a sign of sequence or verification of the the sample can be helpful if this query arises that whether this has been done or not. And we did this in this particular case. And subsequently, on the fourth time point, it decreased, but rest remained same. Uh, then we got a sample post DMT and uh, IDH1 completely gone, IPZF completely gone, but we were still getting the ASLX mutation that is present in this. This is post BMT, two samples are there. Just wanted to show the application that this, this is being utilized in this uh, AMM, um, uh, area also. Uh, but this is not the right way. You need a separate panel which can go down to 0 0.001. This is 0.1%. This is 1% sensitivity is what you are. Are you getting me? Am I making sense in this area? Uh, okay. Excuse me, sir. So I have one doubt. Yeah, Post please. BMT, how can we explain the presence of ASXL1? Uh, um, to be honest, I don't know. And because I don't know. I don't have the complete history. I'm just sharing what I've got. And I won't be able to make comment on what is happening. No, 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 no. That otherwise we would have gotten all the samples. See, if I'm getting uh, in my databases, I would have got that in general. So this could be germline. This variant is gone or this variant is not there. I don't know. I won't be able to comment on that. Yeah, yeah. I cannot comment on that. Word. Okay, so then patient one, this is another 75 year old case, a case pan cytopenia, another complex keratite. This type of keratite tells you this is complex, very complex, not to understand. And when you look at the mutation profiling, we got a, a, in this assay run and TP53 mutations were there. This is a pathogenic. And uh, you see the loss of function, ASCAP, missense, coverage is 2000X, and the, this is the Cosmet ID. So giving the detailed information is important when you're considering this. The point is TP53 correlates with the complex keratite. So if you're getting TP53 complex keratite, this makes sense to you that this is a, uh, you're in the right direction. It has happened that keratite is not giving correct information or something is wrong with the keratite and I'm getting TB3 mutation means this is high risk and I can correlate accordingly. Okay. The one other case, 58 year old uh, microcytic or bicytopenia anemia called as MDS uh, RAB1, presenting with anemia mutation in the SF3B1 gene. Uh, this is you know very commonly described with RARS uh, mutations. Then uh, pancytopenia and revolution, according on these, you're getting mutation in SRFS2 and PHF6 genes. Again, helping you demonstrate that this is clinical in nature. Again, sometimes confirming uh, um, that this is a clinical. Uh, uh, no. Another case of 36 year old MDS having PHF6 tag 2 EZS2 mutations at variant uh, other uh, uh, frequencies. And one point is important to note that since we are sequencing many a times, you will get uh, cases where the variant relief fraction is around 10% or less than 10%. That time, not to call it causal, you have to consider chip in the in that consideration. Not every variant relief fraction, uh, you know, will be causing that because sometimes in a normal individual, you will get uh, in a certain mutations. Those are usually less than 10%, and they may not be contributing that. So not every mutation less than 10% would be attributed to the uh, cytopenia. It could be something else. 
So please keep it in mind. Don't overcome really MDS just because on the basis of MDS because these could be normal patients which are having chip or or, or in that way. Okay. Seventy-two so, then uh, refractory ring pseudomonas, MDS, and you're getting pathogenic SF3 D1 mutations very, very commonly implicated, or uh, it correlates very well. So, just to give you some flavor of the things how they come along, uh, uh, one other essay that I just wanted to highlight was a uh, kinase domain mutation analysis by NGS. So, this is an area where traditionally we use Sanger sequencing as the approach, and then um, um, this is a, a, a Sanger sequencing. Basically, you get a uh, RNA, you uh, run your RT PCR, BCR amplifier, or BCR ABL, and sequence that kinase domain through a two step protocol. And it tends to give you sensitivity of around 5 to 10 percent, is what you use it. And, uh, uh, but, but, uh, and this has been the kind of, uh, um, recommended way for documenting kinase domain mutations. We developed this essay. This is an MPSeq based uh, uh, essay, and you have uh, just showing you this is the kinase domain being covered uh, with various amplicons, and it tends to cover the 160 to 500 uh, of uh, this essay to try to cover the kinase domain. So, just sharing you customization of an essay to use it for the kinase domain mutation analysis. Commonly, commonly we test it through uh, Sanger sequencing, and here what we do. You isolate your RNA, you prepare your cDNA, amplify the kinase domain by specific primers, then there is second amplification using the uh, kinase domain pool, then you prepare your library and then uh, pull it into a sequencer, sequence and analyze using ion repeater software. Uh, but this essay has been customized through through the using uh, AmpliSeq and uh, while variant analysis, we used ion repeater 18.2.0. Uh, and at the end, uh, we just mentioned here is some of the exclusions that we do. And uh, and this is some, it is coming into the guideline that you need to move into an NGS based system in this area. And it's not available. So you need to customize in this front uh, uh, some of the mutations being covered. Just sharing some of the uh, data regarding 21 uh, samples, we tried to validate it. And all the samples were validated by Sanger sequencing based assay. Uh, so here we had uh, 13 samples which were negative and the samples which were positive. Uh, you could see here that you know uh, uh, see, we got the whatever mutations have been detected on Sanger were picked up by NGS along with the variant relief fractions like T31 L5 was present at a variant relief fraction of 17%, so 76%. In this particular case, you had four clones you know, at variant relief fractions and, and later on post treatment, uh, we, we were able to get up to one clone with the to 5% or other. Claims were there. So these could be implicated in the therapy next time onwards. So it is important to be able to document by NGS or additional method. Uh, are you all with me? I'm going a little fast. So kind of domain mutation analysis and NGS based assay, trying to show a self or customized assay how it is validated uh, because kits are not available. So you can use AmpliSeq designer or other way to design your essay and subsequently use it for your clinical uh, control. When you're using for your, any essay for your clinical, you need positive samples and negative samples for your validation. I showed you AML myeloid using positive negative samples and controls. And here, another kinase domain essay uh, using positive neg negative samples, you were able to get uh, the, um, the variant fraction. So 100% concordance were there. And subsequently, we have been using this in, other, uh, in an hour, I think 15, 17 uh, patients that we have used it uh, uh, with very good results and very happy with the results. And we are lucky to publish this. Spandan has developed this essay uh, uh, in-house. So with that, I come to the end of this session. Thank you so much for your question.